All right, welcome back to Talking Ball with Pat Leonard. Week 13 recap edition with Super Bowl 50 champion, former NFL wide receiver, Benny Fowler. And everybody needs to stop the presses right now. This may never happen again with my bookie here on the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast on the Believe Network. I posted a 15 and one record against the spread in week 13 of the 2024 NFL season. Two and one on Pat's picks. We went a perfect 3-0 and on Thanksgiving after going a perfect 3-0 and on Pat's picks in week 12. So 3-0 and on Thanksgiving, 8-1 and in our last nine Pat's picks, and 15-1 and against the spread this week, week 13 in the NFL season. The point here is what are you doing if you aren't already tailing my picks with my bookie? You want to go to my bookie, use the promo code Pat's Picks at the link in my social media profile, and you'll get a 100% match on your first deposit of $50 or more, all the way up to $1,000 plus a $10 casino chip. So an extra grand in your account for free, and I'm making you money this football season with my bookie. Also brought to you here by Boom Chaga Mushroom Super Drink, a natural extract loaded with anti-inflammatory, immune-boosting antioxidants and heart-healthy compounds. You can easily pour this natural liquid supplement into any of your favorite drinks. I put mine in my coffee every morning and immediately feel the difference. I personally have felt a post-workout-like energy boost with Boom. Chaga also has the ability to lower cholesterol, reduce inflammation, and improve immune and heart health with its beta-glucans and antioxidants. Go to boomchaga.com today to place your first order. Use the discount code TALKINGBALL25 or access it through the QR code on your screen and you'll get a 25% off discount on your first subscribe and save order. Right now, that means a month's supply costs you only $30. Start feeling the difference today at boomchaga.com. And Talking Ball with Pat Leonard on the Believe Network and on the PL on NFL YouTube channel is brought to you by Estate 98 Coffee. Estate 98 Coffee is a specialty coffee concentrate perfect for when you want to make a quick cup of coffee and skip the lines. Takes me less than 10 seconds to make a delicious Estate 98 iced or hot coffee. It's great as a mixer for espresso martinis, and each bottle can make up to 16 cups. Go to estate98.com backslash talking ball to get an exclusive offer for 80% off your first order. And now on to talking ball with Pat Leonard with Super Bowl 50 champion Benny Fowler, recapping the action of week 13. All right, we are back. Talking ball with Pat Leonard, week 13 recap edition. It's first down with Benny Fowler. It's our Super Bowl champion, former NFL (laughs) wide receiver, back in the building after a big win out in Denver, Benny Fowler. What's up? What's up, Beans? Monday night football. It is, I mean, it's you're the only game in town. You're the only game on TV, and the Broncos showed up. But so did so did the Cleveland Browns. Shout out to James Winston, you know always slinging the pill around, I mean, 497 yards. And also you got to shout out Jerry Judy coming back to Denver and sticking it in Sean Payton's phase and also the Denver fans. Like, hey, I had this talent all along. I didn't have anybody throwing me the ball. I mean, 235 yards receiving in one game. I mean, that's top notch. People don't just do that. So shout out to Jerry Judy and Jameis Winston. But most importantly, I would love to get a shout out to Sean Payton, Bo Nix, Cortland Sutton, the offense, the defense. I think Denver is rolling right now. I think Sean needed his year to figure out what does everybody do well. I think he needed the beginning of the season to do that. And you're seeing Bo Nix play some really good football, complimentary football. You're seeing Cortland step up as a one, making incredible plays. And just the overall team, the chemistry. Shout out to Nick Benito. Double digit yeah. sacks and a pick six, which hasn't been done since Vaughn. So shout out to my Denver Broncos and and what they're doing right now and looking like we're gonna get back in the playoffs. That's in, it's incredible to see. Benny, this game, first of all, uh, any game Jameis plays in now, I feel like is the most entertaining game of the week or top three. But also what I was reminded of watching the Broncos, especially, but both of these teams, there's a lot of NFL teams and coaches and the way that they strategize to try to win games where they're just scratching and clawing and they have to be perfect to try to win. What I appreciated about specifically watching Sean Payton last night was 
it was a reminder that this is a race to see who can score more points, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the, you don't want to give up almost 500 yards passing. And that's part of the reason it turns into a shootout. But don't you think there's something about the way a good offensive or a great offensive coach coaches can, can instill some confidence in what your team is and what you believe you can do when it's a reminder of like, uh, all right, they scored. Like we're going to go back and score the next drive. Absolutely. And you saw the way that Sean was calling plays. I mean, he was calling shots last night. He wasn't calling conservative dink and dunk plays. He was like, he saw the matchups that they had. He saw to get Bo out on the move. And that's what he did. And those are the types of plays he called. I mean, the, the 93 yard touchdown to Marvin Mims. I mean, number one, that's a ballsy throw, but that's definitely something Sean told him in the, in the huddle or probably in his helmet. Like, Hey, we're going to get a Tampa two safety. Marvin is going to beat the linebacker with his speed put this ball on a rope. So you mm. saw those types of plays and even the couple of interceptions that Bo threw, he was going to take chances. And right. I know that was probably talked about all week and emphasized all week for Sean, like, Hey, we're going to have chances, throw the ball up and let our players go make a play. You know what the play that really stood out to me too. That That's a really good point, by the way, like kind of the pre-play coaching of it. The, when they were backed up against the goal line, first Bo Nix avoids the sack on a free runner and dirts it to get another down. And then they called like a rollout to the right where he had a couple different options, like one short one where he could have maybe thrown it deep and it would have gone out of bounds and complete or been caught on the sideline. And he held the ball, waited for Sutton to come across the field through the zone into that pocket. And then still moving to his right throws an accurate dart right into his chest for like a 20 yard gain. I mean, Benny, that's, you know, you could count on one hand maybe or two hands, I guess, the amount of quarterbacks in the league who can make a throw like that, especially under that kind of pressure. I mean, America saw it last night. Yeah, America Denver's got their it. player. Denver's got their quarterback now, and I think the Denver fan base is now feels comfortable in terms of now going forward. You have your QB, you have your head coach, and now how will you surround – them both with players moving forward and in the draft and in free agency. So it's, it's awesome to see. And I know everybody's excited here in Colorado. Yeah. I was going to bring it up later, but this jumps me right into a topic I wanted to address. The coach of the year running is kind of crowded right now, in my opinion, like you have Sean Payton in Denver, you have Mike Tomlin in Pittsburgh. I mean, the guy's incredible. Um, you know, you can't argue with, of course, the results of, Andy Reid finding wins, Sean McDermott, 10 and two Buffalo Bills. But you look on the other side and obviously Dan Campbell, I mean, how do you not put Dan Campbell at the lead? But I, And even Benny, I know that the coordinators are doing a lot of work here, but it would be wrong to not include Nick Sirianni <clears throat> with the Eagles rolling and the fact that they, they have game planned exactly how to win every week. I don't know if anybody jumps out to you there right now. We obviously have several weeks to go. But to me, this is as impressive of a kind of a top five or six, whatever you want to call it, of coach of the year candidates as I've seen in a while. Yeah, I would say right now the coaches that really stick out to me are Mike Tomlin and Sean Payton. I mean, what Mike Tomlin is doing, and he is actually one on my, my shout out list as well. Mm. Starting off the season four and two with Justin Fields, playing gritty football, winning with the defense, get it done, make a ballsy move to put. Russell Wilson in who hasn't played well in a couple of years. And now he's playing super complimentary football in some of the best football of his career. Yeah. So Mike Tomlin for sure sticks out in a tough division, already getting wins against Baltimore, already winning, getting, get, getting wins against Cincinnati. I mean, and then no losing seasons. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, I just, I don't understand how he is just that good. I mean, with, really average quarterback play. I'm not talking about this year, but the previous years. I mean, quarterbacks that only threw seven touchdowns in a season, and he was still able to get those teams to the playoffs and have a winning record. So shout out to Mike Tomlin and then Sean Payton for sure. I mean, just with all the dead money, the ability not to really sign any free agents and the type of free agency that you want to have and the cap hits that we have here in Denver, and for him to have this rookie quarterback playing this well and a chance to be in the playoffs, in the wild card, in this in our division is incredible with the Chargers, the Broncos, and the Chiefs. So 
is this the best division in football right now? I mean, might seem like it in terms of just the competition. Now, obviously, you have the AFC North, and then you also have the the NFC North, I believe, as well. But mm-hmm. those are the two that really stick out: Sean Payton and, and Mike Tomlin. Tomlin has had an argument in hmm. about every other year, at least, to have won the Coach of the Year award. It, it really is remarkable. I saw you repost that stat that he hasn't had a losing season in what fifteen or sixteen years as an NFL. Every player. year as a coach is crazy, Ast- astounding. I mean, he had Duck Hodges playing uh, like half a season at quarterback the one year. He still went eight and eight or nine and seven. Um, Benny, this brings me to I, I have kind of a bold take here i'm not sure if you agree with me or not but you you know i've been pretty high on the steelers and i know i dropped them out of my top five last year a couple weeks ago when they had a disappointing loss so maybe i'm a fair weather uh, predictor here but i feel like if they were to face the chiefs in the playoffs i think that the steelers would beat the chiefs what do you think of that i think absolutely not (laughs) why (laughs) number one they're gonna have to go to kansas city Number two, the different defensive looks and pressure that they bring. I don't think Russell Wilson can escape that. Number three, I just, I mean, I'm not going to bet against Patrick Mahomes in a single game elimination. And I'm not going to bet against Andy Reid with a week to prepare for just one team. So as tough as they are Mm -hmm. and as great as they are, and TJ Watt will probably have a field day on Kansas City's offensive line. Whatever they have to do to beat that team, they'll do it. So I just don't see people going into Arrowhead for a single game elimination and, and beating the Chiefs. You So I know you just mentioned it, but you trust that Chiefs offensive line for four quarters against the Steelers defensive line? No. I trust Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid, though. Mm. I don't trust the offensive line, but I trust them. And I mean – I've seen Patrick Mahomes go to the Super Bowl with that type of offensive line. I mean, they end up losing to the Bucs, but I've seen it happen. Right, right. You have you have evidence of it. All right, this this Steelers team, such a good combination of toughness and efficiency. And I know that he's not going to make big plays against everybody. <laughs> I, I agree with you there. The Wilson kind of moon ball deep shots. You know, he Cincinnati does need defense sucks. So right. We right. also have to like they played the Giants, they've played the Jets. Cincinnati, yeah, Baltimore. That was like the low scoring game, and then somebody else. But like against the Browns, good teams, yeah. against good teams, he's played average ball at Russell Wilson has. That's true. That's true. Against really bad teams, he's played really well. But like Cincinnati's, I mean, were they the only team in NFL history to have seven losses or eight losses where they scored thirty points? Like that really is an, an insane stat. Yeah. So, yeah, no, to your point too, Russell, I mean, like a lot of quarterbacks, but you, you could almost put Derek Carr in this conversation too. a guy who like, if you give him, you know, 10 seconds or, you know, seven seconds, he's going to carve you up. But if you're in his face in two and a half seconds, he's going to make mistakes and not score a lot of points. Right. hundred percent. Yeah, no, that that's fair. That's fair. Well, when the Steelers take them down in arrowhead, I'll be looking for my flowers um, (laughs) in the play. (laughs) Um, The most impressive win of the weekend has to be the Eagles beating the Ravens in Baltimore and kind of stamping themselves as, um, as Super Bowl contenders. I think we already knew they were in that conversation. Um, you know, this probably continues our shout outs portion and, you know, Saquon (laughs) is a staple of this, but just curious from your vantage point, just what stood out to you? What was most impressive? Any concerns on on either side, whether it's the Ravens and how they handled it? Um, but just want your breakdown of Eagles 24, Ravens 19. I think it's just hard to account for Saquon in terms of the passing game, the running game. But I think the shout out this week for the Eagles would be go to the offensive line and what they are doing up front. And I mean, Jalen Hurts getting in the end zone, I believe twice or once with the tush push. But I think their offensive line is really what's, going to separate them in the long run. It's that the fact that they can run the ball, they can run the ball with the quarterback, and then if you give them man-to-man because you have to load the box, they have two incredible threats on the outside. Now, Devontae Smith didn't play, but you still have A.J. Brown. You still got Goddard. But their offensive line is is really you know where my shout-out goes to for that game. 
I'm worried about Baltimore. They're definitely not in my top five anymore, losing to Pittsburgh and then losing to hmm. and then losing to Philly. It just, you know, I, I don't know what's up with Lamar in terms of him not using his legs anymore. I think it's incredible that he's been passing a lot from the pocket, but what are you trying to prove in terms of staying in the pocket? If you want to win a Super Bowl, you have to use your legs, and that's that's totally fine. Like, get over it. Get over your ego. If there's nothing there, run the ball because there's nobody who can keep up with you at the linebacker level or at the defensive line level. And then Justin Tucker. It's it's scary watching him kick right now. And he's, you know, arguably one of the best kickers in NFL history. And right now it looks like he has the yips out there in terms of it's 50 50 if he's going to make the field goal or extra point right now, which is kind of scary, especially you because you're these games in the playoffs are going to be close. So mm-hmm. he's got to get it figured out and. You know, if it keeps happening for the next couple of weeks, I think you 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 got to bring somebody else in. Yeah, that really is something to see. Baltimore, I believe the stat is they have five losses by a total of 22 points, and Tucker's misses have cost them 22 points this season. So you can see the difference that it will make and could make come playoff time in the postseason. I think that's a great point by you about the Eagles offensive line. My shout out it, specifically there, one thing that has really occurred to me over the last five weeks or so, before the season, I thought it was being overlooked that the Eagles had lost Jason Kelsey and Fletcher Cox. Everybody was talking about it on both sides of the ball. Mm. But it's one thing to say, you know, we're going to try to replace them. We have guys that we've selected. We have guys that we drafted or signed to do it. It's another thing for Howie Roseman to have mm. – obviously seen that Kelsey was coming down the end of his career and he drafts Cam Jurgens, mm-hmm. and he plays guard before moving back to his natural position of center to replace Kelsey. And then you have Jalen Carter, the first round pick at the tackle. Obviously they took Jordan Davis as well, but he hasn't panned out the same way, but both defensive and offensive lines for the Eagles is now back to the dominant level as far as how they handle other teams. I'm not saying Jurgens is Kelsey, but I just think a shout out goes to Howie Roseman for that move. And then also Jurgens, if you watch Benny, they are able to run the same concepts and get the center upfield and use his athleticism on those second level runs the same way at Kelsey. Like they literally drafted the same traits to not have to change the way the offense functions to help Jalen Hurts and Saquon Barkley. And so I really think that's just a masterful job of it's a combination of like team building, player development, and coaching that I think is you don't often see it come together like that. Yeah, it's an incredible job by them, an incredible job by him. Complimentary pieces for the quarterback, complimentary pieces for the new free agent running back that you brought in that just is, you know, unworldly talent. And then, you know, everything just everything is supporting one another. So yeah, how he just knows how to construct a roster. And he's been doing it for years now. Yeah. And this brings me to another another bold take I have, though. I feel like I'm not the only one who's who's saying this after watching the Eagles' impressive win over the Ravens. If the Eagles were to overtake the Lions for home field and Detroit has to come to Philadelphia rather than host the NFC Championship game if it gets to that point, do you agree with me that you like the Eagles in the outdoor game versus the Lions in the indoor game. 1,000%. <clears throat> Playing indoors 12 out of 16, 12 out of 17 games or whatever Detroit will play is crazy. But, yeah, if they have to go and play outside, especially in a in a cold Philly game, it'll be tough. But at the end of the day, I actually, well, I don't think it'll be that crazy because Detroit's offensive line is nasty. And they have – a two-headed uh, backfield in terms of Montgomery who played in Chicago and then Jamar Gibbs, just super dynamic. Now I'm not going to just count out Ben Johnson just because they're going to play in the cold. I think Jared Groff might struggle a little bit, but at the end of the day, in those cold games, that's when you lean on the offensive line in the run game. And I know Detroit, you know, you got Zeitler out there who was in New York. He knows how to play in the cold. Penny Sewell doesn't care about anything. So they got an inc- incredible <laughs> offensive line. So, I'm not going to just uh, disrespect Detroit like that. I got you. Yeah. I, did, I don't want to ignore either. You mentioned it, but 
Jalen Hurts, you know, his stats don't show it, but you you mentioned how he played the right way. I felt like he made the right decision with the ball all game. You yep. know, uh, there was one play he handed it to Saquon where he should have kept it and would have had almost a free run, you know, for 25 yards. Other than that, though, even the way I know he's, it seems like he's dealing with something with his ankle, but I actually like when he runs, how he slides, protects himself. Um, you know, that third down pass to Dallas Goddard was key when they needed it. He made, he made the play. And I just feel like what, you know, obviously when you have a defense playing like that, you can, you can handle the game a different way. Offensively, you don't have to open it up, but you know, shout out to him as well in Philly there. Um, really well done by Jalen hurts. Um, the Buffalo bills, I mean, absolutely spanking the Niners here, Benny. And announcing themselves as a team i don't think anybody really is interested in playing <laughs> uh definitely seem to be on the short list as far as josh allen <clears throat> mvp as well as buffalo bill super bowl contender but what's what stood out to you more in this game the way the bills attacked or the way the niners who are banged up kind of completely folded I don't think any one of that those things really stood out to me. I just think that the Niners just aren't where they used to be. Fred Warner's playing with a fracture in his ankle. Trent Williams is out. Christian McCaffrey's been hurt all year. Yeah. Purdy's dealing with the shoulder. Debo Samuel's not the same. Brandon Ayuk's not there. George Kittle's getting a little bit older. I think their window is pretty much closing, and they're going to have to reboot. That's what really stood out to me in terms of that game. Josh Allen's playing incredible. Buffalo's playing incredible. Well, we've seen this movie with the Buffalo Bills before. We thought just because they lost Stephon Diggs that they weren't going to be a good team. I think it actually makes them more dangerous because now you don't have to really focus on, hey, I got to get this guy the ball or else he's going to be pissed. I think quarterbacks play better when they don't have that type of pressure on them from a receiver who's always complaining about getting the rock. So nothing really surprises me about what Buffalo is doing. Josh Allen's playing incredible. I don't think he's the MVP because I think Staquan – is just doing so much more and adds so much more value to this team. Buffalo has been good the last five years. So Josh Allen hasn't played well enough to beat Lamar Jackson or Patrick Mahomes out for the MVP. That doesn't mean he just automatically gets it this year. Saquon is no the most valuable player to the Eagles. We, we can see it in terms of the record, in terms of how they play. Buffalo has been number one, number two seed every year. So, but Josh Allen is at the end of the day, he's playing incredible. But that none of this actually matters for Buffalo until they actually get to the Super Bowl. So this is a great season for them, great for their fans, great for Josh as he continues to play well. But none of this actually matters anymore for him until he gets to the Super Bowl and wins. And he has to do it in the playoffs. And he's played well in the playoffs, but not well enough to get to the ultimate level. So that's what we're all waiting for. Yeah, I agree with you. And listen, everybody knows this is essentially the Saquon MVP podcast. We've been telling you, <laughs> Benny's been telling you since week one. I agree with you, though. I, I think it's interesting seeing the NBC broadcast push Josh Allen as the favorite and also um, the odds, you know, in Vegas still strongly favor Josh Allen. I think that if Saquon stays healthy, knock on wood, and keeps this pace, and the Eagles finish the season. I mean, they have Carolina, Pittsburgh, Washington, Dallas, Giants. They could easily, they're definitely going to win, I think, three of those games. They could win four and they could win five. I think if they finish that strongly and he's coming close to or breaking the rushing record, or even if he has 2,000 yards, I don't know how you don't give it to him. Um, so I'm, I'm right there with you. And um, that's a good point, though. The, the Buffalo Bills and even their fans know this. It's it's just about what they do in January and as they hope in February. 100%. Benny, do the Vikings? The Vikings are ten and two. Um, they they get out of this one by the skin of their teeth. 23, 22 over the Cardinals. Not that they haven't earned the ten wins, but do they belong in the category when we do our power rankings and we talk about contenders? Like, do they belong in the class of? you know, Chiefs, Bills, Eagles, Lions, do they belong there? Or is it just that their record's there, but they're kind of, they're, they're missing something? Their record's there, but yeah, I think they are missing something. I think you're spot on. I just, they don't have anybody on that team who really 
Justin Jefferson scares you, but you also know that Sam Darnold needs to throw him the ball. So the connection between them doesn't necessarily scare you in terms of that. So, I mean, they mm-hmm. got Aaron Jones. I mean, they got some incredible weapons, but 23-22, winning some close games. The defense, yeah, it's just something about their team, their overall aura that I think that they, you know, they don't really scare anybody. So they're a good team, though. I think we'll learn more about them over these next four weeks. They're Yeah, they're 10-2. So, you know, we'll, we'll learn over these next four to five weeks, we'll learn who exactly who they are because they'll have some divisional games. They'll have some tough games, and then we'll be able to tell more. But right now, I don't think they scare anybody in the NFC or AFC in terms of like, hey, we – Besides Justin Jefferson, you know, who really scares you on that team? Not saying that they're not great players, but like I said, you have to rely on Sam Darnold being on point to get yeah. those other people the ball. Right. It needs to be Aaron Jones for them. That w- That's what it was earlier in the season. We'll see if he can kind of get back to the level he was early year. What I saw in that game too, Benny, was – the Cardinals defensive line was all over Donald. I think, you know, without Darasaw, who's out for the year, their left tackle, it looks to me like they can't protect him very well. And you called my attention to this more last week when we were discussing Daniel Jones going to Minnesota, maybe how he could fit into the offense. And you were talking about like the timing based route concepts and offense and, and passing game of Kevin O'Connell. And I think what I see is, it's like if Darnold's on schedule, he's going to get the ball out to Jefferson for those catch and runs, and Jefferson's going to be open. But between w- with the protection not being great and maybe the connection from Darnold to Jefferson not being like 100%, it's almost like if there's anything off there at all, it gets off schedule and nothing really happens. You know? Yeah. That's mm-hmm. that's kind of how it looks like to me. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, 10 and 2 is 10 and 2, but still impressive um, that they were able to get a win when they didn't play their best. But interestingly enough, Benny, it it reminds me why Kirk Cousins was a good fit there. Because if there's one thing he does well, it's put his back foot down and get the ball out on time. Yep. Um, and I'm watching him in Atlanta. And I don't, Benny, I don't know what to make of this. I'm sitting there saying, you got to go to Michael Penix Jr. in the second quarter, in the third quarter, in the fourth quarter. <laughs> Something is wrong with Cousins and the way he's seeing the field. His arm didn't look the same. Um, I know you're a big Kirk guy, you know, Michigan State, Spartans. Go green. And, yeah, <laughs> and he's and he's played a ton of great football in the league. So I, I've been I've been wanting to ask you about this game, this situation. Like, where do you go if you're the Falcons after I mean, that was a very winnable game where your defense actually finally played well. I think. You know, Kirk has one of these little blips every year where he has a weird game and where you question like, hey, well, what's going on here? He, I feel like he had one in Minnesota every year, one in Washington every year, where it was just a weird game. And then he comes back out and then he gives you, you know, the you the you like that. So <laughs> right, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Lulls us term- to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. He lulls you to sleep and then he comes out and then he's on fire. Bang, yeah. We'll see where it goes. But I also think that what we saw or what we're seeing from Aaron Rodgers and also Kirk, two people who are coming off of Achilles injury at the quarterback position is actually a lot tougher than, uh, than not necessarily that we thought, but you know, they're not young guys, you know, I don't know. Kirk's 36, Aaron Rodgers is 41. So these guys later on in their career, Achilles injuries planned on turf, What's the recovery like? I mean, I think it's just getting tough. Yeah, Kirk's arm is looking a little, it's, you know, he just looks older. So, yeah, it looked different. Like there were throws there where he made the wrong read, let's say, but normal Kirk Cousins still gets the ball there and it gets batted down or something like that. That one pick six out to the right didn't look like him. I mean, that that was a, that was a strange, strange flow, uh, throw hanging in the air for too long. Did I uh, skip over any shout outs that you had that you wanted to dish out? Brock Bowers. Shout out to Brock Bowers. Credible tight end, drafted in the first round, but really living up to the hype. And he's the only thing that's exciting right now in Vegas. But, I mean, 10 catches, 142 a touchdown. 
just playing incredible ball. I mean, he, I mean, he is going to be an incredible player. And I think Gronk said it on TV is that like, he's going to be way better than me or oh. his staff will be way better than his. And I'm not going to go that far because Gronk had an incredible career, but Brock Bowers, man, what he's doing at the tight end position and what he's doing for Vegas is incredible. So that was my last shout out. And I think I, I said a little bit of a shout out to Russell Wilson too, in terms of the, the ball that he's playing complimentary football, getting the ball out on time. And he really has those players in the Steelers locker room really believing. I was talking with one of my friends about it last night and he was like, man, I know his two years sucked in, in Denver, but he's, a, this guy's a Steelers fan. He was like, we'll take this all day. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's, uh, you know, well, I you- mentioned Arthur Smith before, but. There's something going on there with the way that Smith and Wilson are communicating and kind of like, Benny, if there's anything I've, I've noticed around football, you know, being years around it now, it's if you can, as a coach and as a player, come to sort some co- sort of agreement or understanding of here's what I do well and here's what I don't do as well. So let's either conceal or avoid or protect you from the weaknesses and let's accentuate the strengths. And I'm, I'm sure the weakness conversation is not always a direct conversation, right. but definitely the ability to accentuate a player's talents and not focus on what they can't do. Like that's what the best coaches do. Am I right? hundred percent. hundred percent. Um, last thing I wanted to get your, uh, your take on was, What do you think of all these fights that happened (laughs) over Thanksgiving weekend? We go to college with Ohio State, Michigan, uh, all over college football, really, with rivalry weekend. And then Jags, Houston with the Aziz Al-Shahir hit. Curious what you thought of that hit on Trevor Lawrence as well. He gets suspended three games. But just, you know, an explosive weekend that really seemed to cross the line in a lot of ways. Want to know what you think of that? Have you ever been a part of something like that, being on the field and seeing some sort of melee develop? Just wondering <laughs> your uh, perspective on all that. I don't really care about the college piece of it. You know, the plant and the flag, that's super disrespectful. If you're going to do something super disrespectful, then be ready to fight. So Michigan fans don't complain or don't say they got to learn how to lose because you're getting ready to plant the flag in the middle of their field. Well, if you're going to do that, you got to be ready to fight. And I think that goes for every other team. So I'm not just going to come into your house and then rub dirt all over your carpet and then be like, hey, Pat, like, well, it just is what it is. Like, no, it's better be ready for some action. So, you know, Michigan's gotten into it with Michigan State plenty of times and Michigan State got the blame for this. Now they want to blame Ohio State. They never want to take the accountability, but whatever. Um, I, love I don't it. really I care. Love it. I don't really care about any of the college football things. I mean, it's a lot of emotion in the game. And then you definitely care about Michigan. You definitely care. (laughs) No, not to be honest, not really. Cause I mean, it's not something that they ever did. Like, I just think that, I mean, I think it started with that game and then it just trickled down to all the other ones. So Mm. it was just like, you know, cause they have the early game and then I think it just went to the other ones, but I, I actually don't care. I think college sports is way different than when I played it. So the loyalty to school, I will always have loyalty to Michigan State, but the, these players don't actually care about the schools and universities they play for. Care about the money first. Um, hmm. So I'll say that dirty hit by the player from Houston. I mean, I'll share here, yeah. And the brawl deserved to happen. And I mean, yeah, you just there's no, you know that the quarterback is sliding. So. And he's he's been in questionable hits all year. So three games, he got three games. I would have suspended him for the rest of the year if I was the commissioner. That's how I would have saw it. Um, there's just no room and no place for that. And then, yeah, I was a part of uh, the Akeem to lead Michael Crabtree in Denver. So you know, oh. got into a brawl about with them in Oakland. When when uh, Akeem took the chain again, yeah, the chain. <laughs> And this, you know, it was crazy. So, yeah, I mean, but that was, Wait, that so was nothing like yeah. any of these. That was a real, we're going to fight on the field and then we're going to fight in the locker room type of deal. You know, and I don't think nobody in the NFL is like that. And, you know, that was just, yeah, that was crazy. So. Wait, walk, walk me, th- walk me through it though. What are, what are, 
what are your emotions? Cause you know, everybody's watching it set, you know, playing Monday morning quarterback, this guy should be doing this. This guy shouldn't be doing that. I mean, how, how chaotic and emotional is it when your teammate is involved in something like that and you have to defend them and then it spills over? Well, we, we have on the same uniform, so it's, I mean, it's emotional, but like, you're not going to let your teammate get jumped by somebody. And if you see those guys running over, it's, you have to put your helmet on, strap your helmet on and be ready. And go over there and I'm not going to, I'm not the first one to fight, but I will defend my teammates and I will defend people who I love and respect and who wear the same colors as me. So, but yeah, it's crazy. It's a lot of emotion. I think they both got kicked out. This is like the first two minutes of the game. So yeah, it was, this was, this was going to happen. It was like one of those hockey fights where you was like, all right, I'm going to see you next play. And then they just throw the gloves down literally right there. The Raiders got the ball on offense. Second play of the game. They get into a fight on our sideline. And, you know, we have to play a whole game after that. <laughs> Everybody knew it was coming, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, we knew it in warm-ups. They were, crap, I don't even think he warm up. I think he was just watching us warm up and looking at Keith <laughs> the whole time. So, <laughs> did, um, d- remind me, I don't remember, did anything happen after the game, like in the tunnels or anything? Or did he, no. was there like security had to prevent people? Do you see Sterling Shepard, uh, Shep, like screaming at one of the Panthers and, they were holding the Panther back from like charging the Buccaneers locker room after that game. That was something else. Young Shep's always, always mixing it up. Young Shep is always mixing it up. Benny, great reminiscing there. Um, great conversation as always. Can't believe we're 13 weeks into this season. Uh, but I'm thankful as always for you being on the talking ball with Pat Leonard podcast and sharing all your knowledge. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you, Pat. That was first down with Benny Fowler here on the Talking Ball with Pat Leonard podcast. A great recap of all the action, the highs, the lows, the shout outs, the standouts, the MVP race, and the wild fights going around college and NFL football on Thanksgiving weekend. The wildest thing, obviously, is if you're not signed up already for my bookie to bet on football, because I told you already, I'll tell you again, 15 and one against the spread in week 13 of this football season 3 and 0 on Thanksgiving 8 and 1 in my last 9 Pats picks you have to tail these picks now and here's how you do it as a first time depositor click on the link in all my social media profiles use the promo code patspicks p a t s p i c k s and you will get a 100% match on that first deposit of $50 or more all the way up to $1000 plus a $10 casino chip So that's a free $1,000, up to $1,000 in your account to bet with my bookie, bet anything, anytime, anywhere, and use that Pat's Picks promo code before that deal expires. Also brought to you here by Boom Chaga Mushroom Super Drink, natural extract loaded with anti-inflammatory, immune-boosting antioxidants and heart-healthy compounds. You can easily pour this natural liquid supplement into any of your favorite drinks. I put mine in my coffee every morning. And immediately feel the difference. I personally have felt a post-workout like energy boost with Boom. Chaga also has the ability to lower cholesterol, reduce inflammation, and improve immune and heart health with its beta-glucans and antioxidants. Go to boomchaga.com today and use the discount code TALKINGBALL25 on your first subscribe and save order and get 25% off. You can also use the QR code on your screen to get that 25% off deal on your first subscribe and save order. Right now, that means a month's supply costs you only $30. Start feeling the difference today at boomchaga.com. Also brought to you by Estate 98 Coffee, a specialty coffee concentrate perfect for when you want to make a quick cup of coffee and skip the lines. It takes me less than 10 seconds to make a delicious Estate 98 hot or iced coffee. It's great as a mixer for espresso martinis, and each bottle can make up to 16 cups. Go to estate98.com backslash talking ball. To get an exclusive offer for 80% off your first order. See you next time on Talking Ball with Pat Leonard.